different gene than causes the, the disease in people for that form of cardiomyopathy, but it has the same function as the genes that cause the disease in people. So it might be. Is it possible for a dog that is positive homozygous for one gene to test negative for the other 24? Yes, most certainly. But I will say in people, they have identified some cases where unfortunate individuals have at least two known mutations that cause the disease, and they tend to have a very bad form of it. But there are enough of these genes that cause the disease that sometimes just randomly two people that have families that have different genetic mutations for disease meet, have children, and those children end up having both mutations. So all of those combinations are possible. Here's a 10-year-old male who's tested positive homozygous. Based on his holter and loss of many litter mates, they started him on medications. But he's been on medications for the past three years and it has done well. His abnormal beats on his holter are less than half of what they used to be before starting medication. And his last echo show only moderate enlargement on one side. Am I going to discuss medications? I can talk about medications a, a little bit at the end. So here's an almost 10-year-old dog who is positive homozygous has evidence of the disease, but has a lower penetrance form of the disease. So he's got VPCs, he's got some dilation, but he showed it at an older age. So he has a lower penetrance of it. And it may even be also that, you know, had she not started this dog on medication, she started him on medication three years ago, would he have progressed faster without the medication? We, we know the medication like antiarrhythmic, sodalol, um, the ACE inhibitors like enalapril and pimabendin definitely are increasing survival in these dogs. What sort of solution am I talking about as far as I'm sending you a solution? It's called something called RNA later, um, and it's a patented solution from a biomedical company, and it protects the tissue normally to do RNA and protein studies. You have to take that tissue immediately at the time of death because those those things, RNA and protein, break down very quickly, um, or you have to immediately freeze it. And so this is a special preservative solution that keeps the RNA and protein good. Now, if the veterinarian puts it in formalin, unfortunately, which is what the solution that most veterinarians, including us, have in our practice, it's useless. So that's a good preservative for taking the tissue and looking at it under a microscope, but it's horrible for molecular studies. So we would have to send out the solution. Uh, next question. For a short time, the Germans were requiring dogs to be tested by cardiologists, and a paper has appeared on the prevalence of the DCM in the German population. I believe that found 67%, so that probably is at least one study of prevalence. Is there something wrong with this paper? No, this is a nice study by Dr. Gerhard West, and there's nothing wrong with it. But same thing. This is a prevalence study based on dogs that could come to see him or cardiologist in that population. And so to me, that's not, that is a biased population. And epidemiologists would say the same thing. Because the type, not everybody, not all of you out there, um, or maybe all of you out there, but maybe some folks at home who chose not to, not to join us tonight or don't want to learn about this disease, would prefer not to find out, even if it's a free study, they prefer not to participate. And then there are lots of Dobermans that live with families and, the, you know, a busy, busy married couple with young kids. Lots of people that don't have time and aren't interested or actually have a, don't believe in veterinary care or only believe in homeopathics. There are actually a lot of reasons, even us. I mean, I don't like to go to the doctor every year, even if it was free. So lots of people are that way with their dogs as well. So all of these studies, and Dr. Wess's, um, Dr. Calvert, Dr. O'Grady's thoughts based on the number of dogs that come into them are based on who will put their dog in a car and come in every year or at least at a certain age and allow us to holter them and echo them. That doesn't sample at all all the dogs living in Pullman, Washington, and uh, all the dogs living wherever you are, where the people were against medicine, didn't hear about the study, and weren't interested. And you might think, well, 
I'm sure it's a random population that's close enough. It's not. It really selects for a group of people. Now, it might be underestimated because it might be that people that feel like they didn't really have a problem and don't have much to lose are the ones that partake in that type of study. Same thing with our genetic testing. Or it might be people that know they've had a problem are the ones that most likely take part in that type of study. In that case, that number would be falsely high. Those those studies are great, and I really appreciate Dr. West, you know, doing that, but you have to view those as they can't be, they really can't be extrapolated to the general population. Here's someone that has a affected Rottweiler. Do I anticipate a breed-specific study for Rottweilers? We have an ongoing study with Rottweilers for congenital heart defect called aortic stenosis that we're actually uh, moving very quickly on and making great progress on. Unfortunately, we rarely see, we see it, but not very commonly do we see dilated cardiomyopathy in Rottweilers in this country. So we don't have an ongoing study. If you want to send us in the sample, we can look and see if it has the same mutation as Doberman's. But so far, Great Danes with cardiomyopathy, St. Bernard's, Irish Wolfhounds have not had the same mutation. Am I correct that the paper I wrote was peer-reviewed and published was entitled uh, PDK4 and its association with Doberman dilated cardiomyopathy? Where could we, a layperson, locate and read the paper? No, the paper had a different title. The paper had this title, a mutation in a gene encoding a mitochondrial protein in the development of dilated cardiomyopathy in the Doberman Pinscher. It was peer-reviewed and published in the Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine in May of 2010. It was also presented at the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine cardiology meeting. That's our one major cardiology meeting that we have every year. Dr. West was there. He asked me a question about how much we holtered these dogs. Um, that it's the majority of our veterinary cardiologists attend that meeting, and it was very well received by them. They really liked the fact that this was PDK4 because cardiologists have known for a long time the importance of energy into the mitochondria. So it is peer-reviewed. We are in the process of doing a much larger paper in which we're working on the functions of the PDK isoenzymes, and that's what the holdup is, is this paper we would really prefer to put the extended paper about the function of other isoenzymes and things in a large scientific journal, uh, just because that, that helps us maintain ways that we fund these additional projects, um, and so that one isn't out yet. But this presentation and that publication was peer reviewed and was presented in full of a room full of scientists, including uh, Dr. West. What is the likelihood that a homozygous positive dog will die of cardiomyopathy? And in the reverse, what is the likelihood that a negative will not get cardio? I don't know that information. I would love to know that information. Again, even in human cardiology and cardiomyopathy, uh, it depends greatly on the penetrance of that individual mutation in an individual family. And in human beings, the individual mutation can have a penetrance of between about 20 to 80 percent. So that means that in some families, only 20 percent of them will get very sick from the mutation, but in other families, 80 percent will. Again, what affects that variability? Is it diet? Is it exercise? Is it different genes? We don't know. And, you know, they would love to know that information really even for human beings because it's very hard to genetic counsel a young family that has these mutations. Um, but we just don't know that information. The likelihood, in my opinion, that a negative dog will not get cardio I think that the majority of negative dogs will not get cardio. I do believe there is at least one other gene out there. Um, I, I think that is a, based on our North American prevalence and looking at, or population of genetics, looking at samples submitted from Dr. Oyama at University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Estrada at the University of Florida, and our samples, um, it would appear that it's only a very small percentage of dogs that have cardiomyopathy and are negative for the mutation. So that's my feeling. Do the DNA test results have any statistical correlation with the clinical diagnosis of DCM? It does. The p-value is less than 0.0001, statistical significance associated with disease. And this person has a nine-month-old puppy that has tested positive homozygous. 
How often should they have that dog echoed and holtered? That's a really good question. In my opinion, even if it's homozygous, I don't think you gain. It's extremely rare that these dogs develop this disease before two or three years of age. So even if you're very conservative, I'm not sure there's much value to evaluating them before two years of age. At that point, I would recommend an annual echocardiogram and an annual Holter monitor. I think that we are working very hard to look at the relationship between strenuous exercise and diet in these patients because this is an enzyme that is affected by certain nutritional things in the heart and the energy level of the heart. And so we are working very hard to obtain that information and try to get it out as soon as possible so it can help people make a decision. The only thing I would say is that, and I don't know this for sure, but if a dog is positive, particularly positive homozygous, I might be a little bit careful about extremely strenuous exercise. Now, I know Dobermans and they're active dogs, and you certainly should let the dog exercise and play. But some folks run with their dogs because they're more athletic than I do. They might run three or five miles with their dog every day or do a treadmill. And um, they'll want their dog to look very muscular, and so they'll put it on a treadmill and do three or five miles every day. I am not sure that I would do that with a positive homozygous dog. Letting them run free in the backyard, no problem. Taking them to the park, dog park, letting them off the leash, letting them run, no problem. Because dogs are such active animals that the exercise physiologists say, really, for them to get a true workout, it's more like three or five miles every day. So let them do what they want. But I'm not sure I would do extreme strenuous exercise. Here's a veterinarian that has a question that says, I'm a of a Doberman that dies or is euthanized due to dilated cardiomyopathy and there's no gene test ahead of time. Is it possible to do heart or skeletal muscle or would the heart and skeletal muscle still be of interest to you? Yes. So if you have a Doberman, if you're a veterinarian or somebody out there has a Doberman that is affected and they haven't had the genetic test done and it's being euthanized, we can even if it it's, doesn't show the disease and you've never had it genetic tested, if we send you the solution, this RNA later, and you put the sample in it, we can genetic test it when it gets here from that tissue. So even if you don't know the genetic status of this Doberman that is dying or being euthanized and you're able to get tissue to us, we would love that because we can do the genetic test from the tissue and the RNA later, and then um, look at the sample. So if you know of dogs, again, unfortunately, I'm not wanting anybody to hurry on and, and you know, not uh, live as long as possible. But if they are being euthanized, we would love to have those tissues. Someone said that they uh, agree with me regarding testing yearly. However, maybe if the cardiology vets were a little more in line with the cost of some of these tests, more people would take part in studies and exams in the long run. All of uh, folks would benefit. Now I know, um, the, so the concern is that um, it's nice for me to sit here and say you should have this work done annually, but it might be very expensive for you to do the testing in your area. Now unfortunately, I have to tell you, like even here at the university, I don't have any control over how much it costs. And I think this is the same in many private practice. The cardiologist does not own the practice, so those fees are set by the owner. And unfortunately, as you know, these days money is very short and, and hospital directors, hospital 